Beck, I'm the director of the local FSA office. And uh, Farm Service Agency is part of the USDA. Um, USDA has a lot of different agencies within locally in most in most offices. Um, there's there's a Farm Service Agency office. There's an NRCS office, usually in the conservation district. There may be some others. But today, what I'd like to talk about is this Farm Service Agency. Just kind of give a, a global view of kind of who we are and what we do. Next slide. Um, FSA was set up in the Departmental Reorganization in 1984. Prior to that, for for several decades, we were known as the Agricultural Stabilization and Conservation Service. ASCS. A lot of people still refer to us as that. In '94, there was USDA was reorganized, took essentially everything that ASCS did. The old Farmers Home Administration took the loan, the the rural, or should I say, the farm loan portion of that out and split Farmers Home into two two uh, pieces. Part of it came to, to the reorganized FSA, which is now the Farm Loan Program side of FSA. The um, municipal side was spun off as a new agency in USDA called Rural Development. There is, there is about four or five offices in the state. They handle all the municipal types of uh, programs, um, small, small towns, uh, maybe a hospital, maybe a uh, uh, a sewer system, those kind of things with rural development. But the, the farm loan program handles the farm loans that would, would uh, that you have, so we'll talk a little bit about that. And we also took over a little bit about uh, the federal crop insurance side, which is now called risk management. Um, they have some main changes, but essentially uh, the, the basic part of, of what we've done since the 30s is still there. And the, the old name kind of said, best is we definitely are a part of conservation service but a big piece of us was uh, price stabilization uh, to kind of take off the, the big bottom troughs so farmers could exist in, in those times. Next slide. We help ensure uh, the well-being of American agriculture um, through our programs and essentially what we are FSA is we are administrators of the programs. A lot, of the, a lot of the programs that we have, um, we will provide the administration, we will handle the paperwork. Um, NRCS has always been our sister agency, they will handle the technical determinations. You'll come in, you'll sign up the paperwork in our office, you'll go and see NRCS and handle all the, the technical aspects of it. Also, there are some, some portions of FSA that locally in the county we usually don't see um, some some imports, some exports, uh, we provide some things. In the past, we've done some inspection service on some uh, federal, federally approved warehouses. Those are kind of off to the side. Essentially, what, what we do is, is those agricultural programs that we deal with, we provide the administration for it. I think the next slide is the same thing, so we'll go to the next one. Um, we help to enhance the environment by development and implementation of programs to basically ensure that our natural resources are there. Um, in a lot of the programs, conservation programs specifically, there is a lot of overlap. We will handle, again, the administration of it. The technical determinations will be handled by NRCS and assisted with the conservation district. We. Um, we will handle the, the base paperwork. When someone comes in and wants to apply for a USDA program, what you do is you'll come in and you'll build your records with our office. We are PII, okay? Personally identifiable information. Essentially what we do is, is any information that you give us, any of your personal information, uh, name and address, telephone number, social security number, um, if you're if you're as an entity, an LLC, a corporation, your tax ID number, we we guard that information. We do not put it on a mailing list and give it out or, or sell it or anything like that. That's there. We work very very hard to 
make sure that uh, it doesn't get out. We, uh, for example, like we will have maps that um, in the past maybe had your farm number on, maybe had your track number, that type of thing. If that's your farm number, if that's your track number, we will give that out to you. But if, if someone else says an operator or somebody wants to get that map, by law what we need to do is we need to take off any of that identifiable information that identifies that farm track, that farm number, back to you as the, as the owner or even the operator type of thing. We have to take that information off. And in some cases in the past where maybe some of this information may have been available, it may not be available now. So we're very careful on what we, we give out. We guard that information. Um, and are very careful on the, the records that we have there. Um, we, we work with closely with NRCS and the districts to achieve a high level of stewardship, soil, water, and uh, air, wildlife. We want to make sure that we protect those resources. A lot of the programs that we have, CRP, those types of things, what we're trying to do is we're trying to, number one, keep the soil in place for a number of reasons. Number one, if we keep that soil on the, on the field, that productivity is going to be there. If you're losing the soil, you may be losing the fertility, you may be losing a lot of the different things on that to where that, that uh, piece of property is not going to be as productive as what it was before. And so we, we want to do that. The other thing that we look at in the global type of thing, if that soil is not being on that field, ultimately it's running into a stream or something like that. Um, we have, we have low water levels right now, and so um, transit across streams, rivers, those types of things are becoming more and more of an issue, which if we can do our job, keep that soil in place, it ultimately doesn't end up someplace else clogging up, let's say the Mississippi River or something like that. So it's very important that we, we maintain that. Also another thing that, that FSA does that uh, both Bruce and I are on is, is what's called the local county emergency board. One of the things that we will look at is we will look at if, if there is a uh, uh, natural disaster going on, if there is a uh, drought or whatever. We gather that information on a county level. We report that for different reasons, for emergency programs, for emergency loan program, those types of things. And also another, another leg of our uh, of our job is, is really, it used to be called National Defense, it's called Homeland Security right now, and we are part that if there is an emergency declared, we may be activated to, uh, to assist with that. Next slide. We're here to help provide a safety net for the producers and also to make sure that there's an adequate food supply for the general population. What we want to do is we, we want to help to assist to maintain viable operations out there. You know, one of the one of the big pushes right now in our in our uh, organization is that for the, the younger farmers coming on. When you look at the average age of a farmer out there, it continues to get higher. We are looking at, at trying to bring in uh, younger operators into that mix to make sure that we do have farmers going going into the future. So we want to make, make sure that we have the operators, the operations that we need out there to continue to provide that adequate, safe and clean food supply. Also, to uh, another thing that we do is we help to uh, compete for export sales of commodities in worldwide marketplaces. We're out there, we're trying to open up markets for that to, uh, to move the, uh, the commodities out and contribute to the year-round availability of a variety of low-cost, safe and nutritious foods. Next slide. Our goals are supporting productive farms, supporting secure and affordable food and fiber, and conserving the natural and enhancing the environment of our, of our communities. Who can qualify for assistance? Virtually anybody that's associated with, with agriculture. We can look at, at farmers and ranchers, either owners or operators of that, that farm. We look at small farmers, we look at limited resource farmers, we also look at socially disadvantaged farmers out there to make sure that our programs are available to, to all uh, people involved in agriculture. 
when we look at locally, we do have a, a number of, of programs out there that are both conservation based, production based, and also um, emergency programs and disaster programs for when we have those types of, uh, of weather conditions out there. Um, both, um, both cropping, both livestock for a variety of different, uh, different programs out there. FSA is set up with, uh, we have a network of field offices, approximately 2,500 offices out there. Wherever there's a, a viable amount of agriculture um, in the area, um, for the most part in, in southern Michigan, there is an office in virtually every agricultural uh, county out there. Um, around the Detroit area, there, there's, you know, not every office, not every county has an office. I know the Kalamazoo office just closed, type of thing. But where, wherever there's, there's agriculture, there's usually a county office in the, uh, in the area. We have 51 state offices. We have about three or four offices in Puerto Rico. Also covers the Virgin Islands. Um, I think we have access in some of the territories of the Pacific. We have state and county office elected officials that are made up of, of local farmers in local areas. They're responsible for overseeing the, the operations of the office in, in the uh, local office. Um, traditionally, producers come in, they, they uh, conduct the business within the office. Uh, we are um, working to ramp up our, our uh, activities and our accessibility on the internet. And so there are opportunities to e-file. There's uh, e-government. Um, we do have a website that if you want to get information, if you want to get forms, you can go on and, and get those types of things. And they're continuing to, uh, to operate, um, to move up into that, to, to make availability. Our county, uh, FSA has always been uh, operated uh, through the county committee system. County committee system is, is basically very unique to, to FSA. It's a county um, elected committee that basically operates the, the local office. Right now what we have is we have three, three farmers that each come from a local administrative area, approximately six townships comprise a local administrative area and each, each uh, local administrative area has, has the, the farmer, plus we do have an advisor. So we do have four um, people on the county committee. Three of them are elected. The advisor is, um, is, uh, um, is there, selected by the, uh, the state office to, to come on. Um, they review the county operations. They provide insight on how the, the programs are going to be. If there's a situation where um, maybe a, a producer doesn't feel that they've been fully served, they were denied program access, what, what they do have the opportunity is to appeal the uh, situation. And what they would do is they would appeal it to the county committee. The county committee would hear it to make sure that they uh, were treated equitably to, um, you know, on that program. So it is a, it is a fairly unique uh, system. We're pretty proud of that. And it, it continues to stay in place. We do have a, a variety of programs, like I said. One of our, our biggest push, though, is, is the conservation programs. And uh, our, our big one, our longest, one of our longest standing, is the Conservation Reserve Program. And what that program does is it takes different types of, of acreages, puts it into a long-term idle program, either grassland, um, you can put it into trees for even a longer-term type of thing. And by maintaining a proper cover, you'd be paid a rental rate for that annually. We have programs that go 10 years. We have programs that go 15 years. After those programs um, um, are, are done, there is the opportunity in some cases to, uh, to reapply and to put that in for another, say, 10 or 15 years. What that is based on, though, it's based on um, a lot of different things, um, erodibility of the soil, a lot of different things and so maybe in one case maybe you may have gotten in maybe in the, the, the next case you know it's an automatic but maybe it, it may not be so you know if you go in 
and you will be able to get paid for either your 10 or 15 year program. There's an opportunity to uh, to reapply and to you know extend that, but that's not necessarily always an automatic. So, but they are rental rates. Uh, in the past, they've been pretty competitive. People have been pretty pretty happy with that. To establish that cover, make sure that uh, we reduce or eliminate the erosion on that that property. There are some different um, programs that uh, that are in place with with that under the, uh, the CRP heading. I know that Bruce had talked about the safe, and one of the things we look at is we look at uh, um, the issues with the domesticated uh, European honeybees and the colony collapse on those. And West Michigan has the opportunity to apply and uh, um, establish some some uh, grasslands for native bee pollinators to uh, to have those. In most cases, that, that establishment is is uh, attached very closely to either an orchard or a vineyard, so those pollinators can can access those those types of crops to make sure that we're we're providing good pollination for our predominantly fruit, but in some cases vegetable crops. We also have some other programs. There's crop insurance out there for a variety of programs, but on some more specialty programs. Uh, where crop insurance is not available. We do have, it's called the NAP, it's the Non-Insured Assistance Programs that helps to provide assistance to eligible producers on, at times when the yields are low and that there's not any uh, insurable insurance on those crops out there. In Michigan, what we are looking at is we are looking at different types of crops. One of the crops that uh, was really affected last year by the frost was sweet cherries. I know that they are working to uh, put a, a sweet cherry insurable insurance policy in place for a lot of those to try to expand that. But there are some crops out there that we have that, that don't have it. In that case, we do have the, uh, the NAP program that's available. Underpriced support um, is a program to help producers manage risk and provide for a low safety net. In a lot of cases, um, some of these programs such as the loan deficiency program, is there when uh, we look at cash crops, um, corn, soybeans, and, and those types of things are very low. What happens is there are some programs that are available to, uh, if the programs reach a target where it's so low, there are some payments that are available. With the price of uh, crops that we have right now, some of these programs really haven't been in place, such as the loan deficiency program. But the marketing assistance loan program is one that people can uh, producers can use to put their grain under loan with our office, get that get that uh, um, loan check to uh, use for for operating for whatever they need, and then it's a low interest loan that that you normally pay back with with um, a principal and interest when the, the crop is marketed. Uh, the, the farm storage facility loan is a new one provides low interest loans for storage facilities, predominantly grain bins, but there are also some other facilities that are out there. If you're a milk producer, um, we, we look at uh, the formula and with milk producers, if the, the feed rate and the price of milk, um, so it's a formula that, that's not there, they may be eligible for some, some payments under that. Uh, the lab we haven't had in, in, a, in a period of time. DCP, um, direct and counter cyclical payments, again, is a, is a program that we have uh, predominantly row crops that they are. Producers sign up for it, fulfill the program guidelines, direct payments are issued, and then counter cyclical payments are there if the, the price is, uh, is, is less than the target price set. For the farm bill, those those uh, counter cyclical payments haven't been there uh, simply because the rate has been there. Um, acre average crop revenue is, is a variation of the DCP program. Again, with the prices that's been there, we haven't received a whole lot of acre payments either. But those again are for the safety net for the, the lower end. Farm loans, agricultural loans have been out there for a number of years. They offer loan and credit counseling, um, individual farm and business uh, planning expertise 
but that is for um, just general operating for purchase of real estate for those types of things. Next one. Program is there. Loans are low interest in extended terms. Um, individual decision making based on each farm situation, not um, formula driven. The loan officers that, that are there for you look at each operation and make those decisions. Direct operating loans um, is for operating expenses for short term purchases, machinery, and livestock. The, the direct farm, the um, FO, we're looking at uh, real estate, we're looking at improvements on real estate, so those are longer longer ones. Emergency loans, like I said before, in cases where maybe we've had some situations where we've had a 30% uh, loss on maybe, say, at least one crop, emergency low interest loans are available, again, to help you get through the, the season and go from there. Essentially what we have is we have the limits, your operating loans are 300, the farm ownership loans right now are three, and emergency loans are 500. We have uh, the, the guaranteed loans limit was was there. And when we look at guaranteed, that's not a direct loan from our organization. We participate with banks, we participate with Greenstone, and if they provide the, the, uh, the, the per, uh, correct oversight, they provide all the, the things that, that we can do, we will guarantee that loan for them. So there's a percentage level that if something should happen to that loan, we will make sure that they're not necessarily hold on that, but they're, they're pretty close, like maybe an 80 or 90 percent. And also what we do is we offer youth loans. For those individuals, those young people, essentially teenagers, high school kids, that are interested in getting into an operation, maybe it's livestock, maybe it's a, a fair steer or something, don't have the, the dollars to do that, we do have youth loans for those individuals. Disaster, uh, again, we do have various different programs that are available out there that if we've had uh, some uh, weather conditions or disaster conditions type of thing, those are, those are there. We also have some different programs that are available for a situation that, that may occur. Um, not, they're, they're not necessarily used every year or available every year, but they're out there to assist producers when we have those kind of conditions. We do have a website that, uh, that we have uh, for those people that want to gain information. They have uh, uh, forms. There is, there's just a lot of information on there. And so, for example, if you need to fill out a form or something, um, you don't want to come in to do that. Uh, I have more and more people going online getting the form, filling it out, and then just either mailing it or, or emailing it and scanning and emailing it. And so those are, you know, those are there. Loan deficiency payment rate, we really haven't used in a number of years. It's there, but it's just we no one's qualifying for that. EGOV, um, again, more and more information coming over the internet that's available there for you. So if you need to, you can get it. It's there. Maybe the office isn't open that day, or maybe it's, it's after hours or something. That information gets to be more accessible all the time. file is important for those reasons and again more and more people are taking advantage of it all the time. Website is, is here. Um, we're, we're the same location that Bruce is on Lincoln Road in Allegan. Um, we're there so you can either you know come in or if the information is accessible you can get it you can get it there. Last thing I would like to say is, is what we have is, is through USDA, there are some, some programs that are going on for some di the diverse groups where the uh, uh, USDA has, has determined that we have fully served um, some diversity groups out there. And if, if there are uh, in individuals that feel that they haven't been fully served or discriminated against, there is an 800 number that you can call to uh, get more information know on that. So uh, there is some settlement money that has been set aside for that. And if there are some groups out there that, that feel that we haven't fully served them, then uh, you know we do have the 
the, uh, the contacts to be able to uh, go forward with that also. Um, with that, are, are there any questions? Yeah, I'm just, you were mentioning conservation reserve program, and so I'm a little confused as to how your program meshes with NSCS. In essence, what we do is we would handle the paperwork. It's the exact same program. Uh, we would handle the paperwork, and so you'd come in, whether you, you know, if you've been in our office, we'd make sure that we have all your information that's updated. If you're a brand new producer, we would, we would uh, gather, um, you know, the basic information, name, address, phone number, um, uh, owner or operator of the farm, what, what piece of farmland that you, you know, control, either own or operate, that type of thing. We establish the information. What we would do is we would uh, fill out the paperwork. Okay. What, what happens there is that in, in a lot of cases you go, you go across the hall and work with Bruce with the, the technical aspect. What kind of, uh, what kind of uh, practices do you want on there? Um, what kind of uh, uh, you know, uh, soil erodibility numbers that you have, the indexes, all those kind of things. It's essentially the same program. We handle the administration of it. Um, NRCS handles the technical aspects of it. Question. Has FSA established any metrics which indicate success at stabilizing soil by getting your water cleaner? Metrics on, um, there, well, there's the, and again, more of a technical type of thing I might draw Bruce in. There's, there's the, the tolerance number, the, the T number, where, right. help me out here, Bruce, <coughs> where, where if you're below the T, essentially, you're, you're eroding at a, at a level lower than, you're, you're eroding at a level that, that you're going to be able to mean, remain productive on that soil. In other words, uh, the, there's not as much soil going off that is, is being re, re, uh, rebuilt on that piece of property. And so T is the magic number that if you're under T, you're going to be able to remain, you know, uh, viable on that piece of property. If you're over T, essentially what's going to happen is that the productivity of that soil is going to go down. It, that's been established for quite a few years. Right. They've, they've had specific scientists working on these in different areas of the country. They use something called a lysimeter where they have um, calculated the infiltration rate and the runoff rate and they've done it with different soils. And all that documentation is available. If uh, you want to contact me, I can try to help you, uh, you know, find the link to that. Uh, it is another division of our USDA. I'm more thinking about the cumulative effect statewide, nationally, because I think there's a lot more support for this type of program. You can say to the public at large that we've eliminated soil erosion, for instance. Um, in, the, in the national level, people focus on that dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, for instance. Um, I think if you can demonstrate that we have significantly reduced the amount of sediment running into the Gulf, <coughs> then therefore I think there's a lot more support for this kind of program. Well, one of the things that you have is you have the sediment from, from agricultural land. You know, there's also there's also sediment, and not to you know not to talk trash on, on other industries, but you know you you have construction sites and you have home sites and you have all of those kind of things. And, you know, there's, there's other areas where this you know where it comes from that you know you have the sediment, you have those those kind of things that that are you know that are happening. And so where you know we're we're working you know fairly exclusively with the agriculture in attempting to you know to do that. There's other industries that also, when we talk about the dead zone, contribute to that. Again, not to slam them or anything, but you know, in a lot of cases, you got you know soluble nitrogen coming off of that. Was that coming off of somebody's yard, or is that coming coming off from somebody's field, or you know, was it a was it a chemical spill from a nitrogen factory? Who knows, you know, type of thing. And so those are the things that you know we're working real hard to reduce those those runoffs and the sediments and that from from agriculture. And I think that we've, we've done, you know, a lot of good things with that. Um, one of the things we did talk about is, is a, a, and I saw a couple, is that the, the waterways, the grass waterways, where what we do is, is you know, we do cost share, 
and NRCS handles the technical aspect of it, where there used to be furrows and gullies and you know where the water runs. Um, we establish grass waterways to where those catch a lot of the sediment before they hit you know, the, the streams, those kind of things. And so there's a lot of programs there, and the government has worked very hard, you know, to to establish that to essentially keep the soil there for you know two big reasons: to number one, to maintain productivity, and number two, keep it out of out of the streams and that, so we don't have to deal with the dead zones and and you know. Uh, sediment, you know, to where, you know, you can't run ships and stuff through those types of things because dredging is very expensive also. So those are, you know, those are the two big ones. There's, you know, there's a lot of other things that are involved with that. But yeah, you know, those, those are things that, that we've worked on and CRP has been around for, since 1985 and we've always had for the last several years. Um, the numbers varied a little bit from year to year, but there's always been at least 30 million acres under contract with CRP um, probably since the early 90s. And like I said, it, it varies a little bit, but <clears throat> currently what we have is we do have uh, a fair amount of pressures with, uh, with crop production out there. And so what we're seeing is some of the land is reverting out of, out of CRP going back into crop production. And, you know, we're trying to, you know, to, to help with that. But if you have a grass cover and now you have row crops, there's always the opportunity that that Soil erosion may increase a little bit. So Dave's going to be here for a few more minutes. 